I'm Avery Sharp. I'm uh, a famous jazz musician now. Um, I've been uh, performing and touring the world with some of the greatest musicians on the planet, starting with some of the people who were at University of Massachusetts when I was there, fortunate enough to be part of. Yeah, I've been touring and recording um, with people like um, McCoy Tyner, um, Freddie Hubbard, Dizzy Gillespie, I've toured, did a tour with Cab Calloway, um, just a number of people, Wynton Marcellus, uh, sort of like a who's who in, in, in jazz. Still writing, still composing for any, everything from, from solo pieces to large orchestras with choirs. So I decided uh, to do a project that would uh, mark the 400th year that Africans were brought to this country, 1619, August of 1619. I call it a musical portrait. And the reason why I call it a musical portrait, it's hard to fit 400 years of history into 60 minutes of, of a recording. Um, so what I did was I broke it up into 100 year increments. And the great thing about being an artist is, is that it's subjective. And I can um, choose the events that I feel that, you know, were kind of meaningful uh, to me. So I broke it up into 100 year increments. I did the first 100 years as, as the arrival, second 100 years, 1619 to 1719 and then 1719 to 1819, the colonial period, and then 1819 to 1919, uh, the antebellum and civil war, and then 1919 to 2019, which would encompass you know, the 20th century and, and everything that happened in, in the 20th century. And um, so I decided to tell the story through music. And what I did was write like I said, I broke it up into 100 year increments, but I did two or three tunes for each increment. It kind of traces back all the music that um, Africans and African Americans bought to this country. I mean, American music would not sound the way it sounds if it hadn't been for the African element and if it hadn't been for African Americans. Just try to picture how that would sound, how music would sound without that, without that, you know, worldwide really influence. And you're saying like, how in God's name is Nashville in the middle of the 400 years? Well, it's, it's, you know, historically in America anyway, in terms of the instruments, I mean, you have instruments from Africa, the violin, which uh, you have the precursor that was in, was in Africa. And the, the violin or fiddle was one of the instruments that um, African-Americans were still allowed to play. Uh, even on on plantations, that and the banjo, and the banjo is a uh, is a precursor for uh, the banjo that was in Africa as well. Slave masters might want you to play what was happening at that time, so you would have to learn what you know would be a classical music if they were trying to be more elite, or a pop music of of that day. Uh, slaves also played th their own music, which was called plantation music. And a lot of that has, in, has you know, in the, in the uh, West Virginia and Virginia, you hear a lot of that music and people think, well, it's just country Western or it's bluegrass, but a lot of that comes from, 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 from uh, black Americans. Yeah. There's a African influence, a, a black influence through all our music. So I'm just saying that to say that there's a strand of black music that permeates American music. You can't, like I said, try to hear even if you think that something is like country Western, it is, I think years ago, one guy said that country Western is just the blues slowed down. Well, without UMass, I wouldn't be the person that I am. Um, I got there in 1972. There were not a lot of black people there, students. But at that time, you had people like uh, Professor Bracey um, there. You had Max Roach coming to that. Max Roach is like the father of bebop music, one of the fathers of bebop music, you know, with Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis. Um, you had uh, Archie Shepp, who was a, you know, a John Coltrane protege. Um, you had Reggie Workman, who was coming up a couple of days a week from Brooklyn, yeah. um, who played with John Coltrane, was one of the first bassists uh, with John Coltrane. 
You had uh, uh, Dr. Horace Boyer, who's one of the was uh, a gospel uh, singer and performer in his own right, and one of the foremost uh, gospel historians uh, in the world at that time. And um, had uh, Fred Tillis, who helped bring a lot of these uh, um, people to the to to campus as well. So from like 1972, when I graduated at 76 to me was one of the richest periods for me in terms of black involvement at, at UMass. I mean, here I had Reggie Workman, Max Roach, Archie Chef on a campus setting. It's hard to get those cast together in New York at one time. And I had them here on, on a campus setting. You know, my, my professors and these people here are creating this, this, this uh, sort of, this entity. And as, you know, as a student, you're like, okay, doesn't everybody have Max Roach as one of your professors? You know, you don't know that you're in something special that these people have, you know, like Professor Bracey and those have created. I actually went to UMass for, uh, for physical education. For, for, for about six months, I thought I wanted to be a gym teacher until I got here and started taking the zoology and biology, which is the courses that I hated most. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I might as well be a doctor. So I got out of that. And um, another one of my interests was, uh, was business. So by the time I kind of got my music thing together, I had already done uh, four semesters and I didn't want to do another eight semesters. So I decided to uh, major in economics because economics was a little bit more abstract thinking. It's not like uh, uh, economics degree at that time at UMass. You weren't going to go work on a Wall Street. It was more radical, you know, Marxism and that that kind of thing. And during that time, I minored in music, and I was in uh, classes with um, Archie Shep, Max Roach, and like I said, Reggie Workman was my first bass teacher up uh, I was playing electric at the time but he taught me upright in the very first year that I started and people like Archie Shep and um, Horace Boyer uh, Fred Tillis and Max took a, an interest in me they obviously saw something that in me that uh, that I didn't see when I first met um, Horace Boyer Dr. Boyer he came to my dorm room and he played a recording for me that he, of, uh, because he needed a bass player for the Voices of New Africa House. And so he said, well, we have a concert coming up. And I said, well, I have to go down, I have to go back to Springfield because my father had a, a, a grocery store that I worked at on the weekends. And he says, well, does, does you, do you have a, a piano at, at your mother's house, your mother's and father's house? I said, yeah, my mother's a piano player. She plays in the church. And so I go home and I tell my mother, I said, uh, yeah, this cat, I don't know, this guy named Boyer, he's going to come over and we're going to rehearse. And she goes, Boyer. She goes, I wonder if it's one of the Boyer brothers. And then she goes to her record collection and pulls out his record. I'm like, yeah, that's the guy. He's just he's a little younger there, but that's, that's the same cat. So he came over to my house, my, my, um, my mother's and father's house. We did the rehearsal and he and my mother were talking. And he was from uh, Winter Park, Florida, and my mother's from D-Land, Florida. And they started talking and knew some of the same people. We lived across the street from the church and my mother went, she, I'm number six of eight kids and my mother would just get sick, almost bedridden with every pregnancy. I don't know how she did it, eight kids. And she was pregnant with me and the Boyer brothers, they came to my mother's church. We lived across the street from the church and my mother couldn't go to the, to the service because she, was, she wasn't feeling well. So she sat on the porch and listened to the, uh, to the, to the church service and to their concert. So I heard him you know, in utero, you know, in, in the womb. I heard him before I met him like 19 years later at, uh, at or 18 years later at, at the University of Massachusetts. I went to work for an insurance company. I was a claims adjuster for three and a half years. And to through in that three and a half years, I started my family, uh, had 
two kids. Um, and I also did a, a year of graduate school in music at University of Massachusetts. And um, I, never, I didn't finish because by that time, Archie Shepp had taken me to Europe on my first tour in 1979. And we were doing a, a live recording at Poly de Glace in, in, in Paris, France, three nights. And they were supposed to record all three nights, but they recorded two nights because they got everything they needed. And the third night, um, this was this was a, a big band, Attica Blues big band, Archie Shep's uh, big band. And um, there was a calypso that, that, that uh, Archie was doing that was written by the piano player, Clyde Kreiner, a friend of mine. And he was on, because Clyde was on the, on the gig and I had my head turned. Originally it was uh, Clifford Jarvis, great Clifford Jarvis was on drums and I had my head turned. And so we start the Calypso and I'm like, wow, Clifford's playing something really hip tonight. And I look over and it's Art Blakey. Art Blakey's on drums, you know? And uh, after the concert, everyone's saying, Art, Art wants to meet you, blah, blah, blah. He really likes you. So I go over and I meet Art and he goes, yeah, when I change bass players, you gotta be my bass player. <laughs> And Charles Greenlee, a great trombone player who was living in Springfield at the time, he was on the tour as well. I said, he's not gonna call me. He goes, if he said he's gonna call you, he's gonna call you. Yeah. So after that tour, it was only like 10 days or two weeks, I went back to my day gig, still working for Aetna. Now I have a dilemma where Art Blakey wants me to go in his band, but in the interim, McCoy Tyner, McCoy's bass player left. And so, McCoy started calling me on my day gig. And so now I've got to make a decision. It's like, am I going to leave my quote unquote secure job? It's not like I'm selling insurance. I'm an insurance claims adjuster. So I get a company card, expense account, salary. It's really cool. So, you know, I got a house now, bought a house, got middle America out of the way. And am I going to chuck this to play music full time, which is what I want to do anyway. And, um, but the, the three things that really hit home was my wife saying, we're not gonna be able to live with you because you're making us miserable because you're not doing what you want to do. My father gave me the biggest vote of confidence. He says, he goes, don't worry about it. He said, you'll feed your family. He said, I gave you that. I was like, snap, Pops believes in me, it's over. Third thing that happened was John, the, you know, the black claims manager, he brings me in his office because I'm equivocating, you know, I got to, am I going to leave this job and blah, blah, blah. He goes, well, Avery, you're going to have to make a, make a choice whether or not you're going to do insurance or music. And my head snapped back. I said, wow, John, thanks. I, I got up and shook his hand. He says, what? I said, when you say it like that, there's no choice. You got my two week notice now. He was like, what? I said, I'm out. I can't bring up the dynamic sex machine. Oh, Lord, here we go. <laughs> here we go. What, what, he, what he's referring to, what, what, what Professor Bracey is referring to, when, when I was on campus and I was an uh, undergraduate, I'm not sure, were you, were you head of the department? You must have been head of the department. Yeah, I think about 1974, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, yes, and that's exactly when it was. Yeah, you were head yeah. of the department. And I had this group called the um, Dynamic Sex Machine. We were very popular on campus. Um, um, like I said, people came to the show and it was a bunch of brothers with dashikis and afros. Um, like I said, there might've been a couple of cats in the group that were trying to live up to that name. But we mostly got, we got that name from at that time, a few years before that, uh, Sly Stone, Sly and the Family Stone had a song called Sex Machine. And then James Brown later came out with a tune called Sex Machine. Get up, get on up. I had my band on campus and we needed a place to rehearse. And we convinced Professor Bracey to give us a room in New Africa House so we could rate, uh, rehearse and store our equipment. He gave us uh, a room that nobody was using up on the fourth floor, which was great but not so great because we had to lift all this back during that. We had a lot of heavy equipment, but you know, we're teenagers. So it was cool. So professor uh, Bracey was also contributing to uh, my musical career by allowing us to uh, use the space at new Africa house. So without the influence of my UMass experience, 
I would I would not have the illustri illustrious uh, jazz career that I have without those people who who um, saw something in me and and pushed me forward. I feel that I mean this is you know this is me anyway. I think we're one of the things that we're here to do in, in life is to learn, you know, and hopefully I will never stop learning until it's time it's time to leave.